I have a desire to tell stories, and I'm never quite satisfied. against the Al-Qaeda terrorist training camps. Martin spent the beginning of the millennium trying to find funding for a project that he had been hatching for more than 20 years. He had purchased the film adaptation rights to the novel Gangs of New York back in 1979, but no studio was eager to invest in such an ambitious project, given the director's frequent commercial failures. But in the year 2000, Harvey Weinstein decided to make Scorsese's dream come true, and Miramax Studios approved the film with a budget of $84 million. Martin now had the chance to express his boldest ideas. Production designer Dante Ferretti, who had worked with the director on The Age of Innocence, recreated five blocks of 18th century New York, stretching for over half a mile in length. Each of the five points is a finger. When I close my hand, it becomes a fist. The colossal structure was erected not far from Rome. George Lucas once came to have a look at the set. Astonished at what he saw, the special effects master took his friend aside and asked him whether he knew that these types of things were being done on computers for a couple of years now. Martin grinned, and Lucas declared the set to be the last of its kind in the history of cinema. Later on, when no one in Italy was able to find an elephant for filming, George helped record and subsequently add a 3D model of the animal to a scene the only use of CG graphics in the film. But back to the development stage. By his own admission, Harvey Weinstein had endured cinematic torture because the director had him sit through more than 80 films to determine the project's visual style. 80, can you imagine? And remember, no videos, no DVDs. Every movie has to be on the big screen. It was like going to school with Professor Scorsese. Michael Ballhaus took over the visuals. The cinematographer had come back to Martin after eight years, whereas previously Michael had portrayed a sophisticated Victorian-style New York in The Age of Innocence. Now it was time to show its other side. Five points, murderer's alley, brickbat mansion, the gates of hell. Casting followed the usual procedure. Martin would listen to the advice of friends and invite old acquaintances to join the production. Seven years earlier, De Niro had acted in the drama called This Boy's Life with a young Leo DiCaprio. Well, on the set of Casino, Robert said that he hadn't seen such talent since Jodie Foster in Taxi Driver. A couple of years later, the world was struck by a wave of Leo mania, but the actor didn't let it get to his head. He fought hard for serious roles that would help him avoid being typecast as a young heartthrob. After Titanic, Leonardo's agent met with Scorsese on the set of Bringing Out the Dead and offered his client services. Martin put the puzzle together. <laughs> Liam Neeson was the next to join the production and was offered the role of Walter McGinn. However, despite the film's tight schedule, the actor wanted to play Priest Valen on the screen. Let the hand that tries to strike us from this land shall be swiftly cut down. <laughs> Martin approved of the swap and invited Brandon Gleeson to play McGinn instead. Could I say what I want? That's what I want again. As for John C. Riley, he wasn't interested in the project at all. You might as well settle with me before settling with each other. John was talked into it by his friend, Paul Thomas Anderson, a longtime Scorsese fan who had even copied a scene from Goodfellas for his film Boogie Nights. GG, listen, Jack and Amber's table, take them over all the clams. Let's go. Bye -bye. Okay, how's it going here? There were some difficulties with Cameron Diaz. The actress had signed a six-week contract, but ended up filming for over six months. <laughs> well, gentlemen, I leave you in the grace and favor of the Lord. <laughs> Finding Bill the Butcher was a much more difficult task. The director had his eye on Daniel Day-Lewis for the role, but after the drama The Boxer in 1997, 
the actor not only announced his retirement, but also disappeared for six months in Italy, where he worked as a shoemaker. The offer was extended nevertheless. Daniel was intrigued by the idea of a mirror image of the Age of Innocence, in which moral violence would be replaced with physical violence, but the actor only agreed after meeting with DiCaprio and his friend Tobey Maguire. You know, when somebody has a talent like yours, it's almost their responsibility to do it, to get back in the saddle. Challenge accepted. The actor listened to the future Spider-Man and, as usual, went off to develop his character. Daniel worked as a butcher for three months. I love to work with pigs. The nearest thing in nature to the flesh of a man is the flesh of a pig. Studied the New York accent of the late 19th century. Man, are you? You see this knife? I'm gonna teach you to speak English with this fucking knife! And handpicked his own wardrobe. He stayed in character while on set, in between takes, and even after hours, never removing his costume. Not to mention, he wore a prosthetic glass eye, which, after much practice, he learned to tap with the tip of his knife without blinking. In Scorsese's opinion, Daniel didn't just play Bill the Butcher, he became him. Oh, I don't never sleep too much. I have to sleep on one eye open, I only got one eye, right? Rude, filthy, and always disgruntled, he would go to the gym every morning, where he would listen to songs by Eminem at full volume. Whatever you say I am, if I wasn't, then why would I say I am? The song The Way I Am personified his image. Bravado, self-importance, and boastfulness were integral characteristics of The Butcher. Is that understood? Lewis's obsession rubbed off on DiCaprio, too. Both actors followed the method approach, so their feud extended beyond the frame. Haven't you never been to the theater before? Nah. DiCaprio once accidentally broke Day Lewis's nose, but Day Lewis played out the rest of the scene. And on the day of shooting the final scene, both actors, without breaking character, fought each other. Their dedication was laudable. But unfortunately, Scorsese and Ballhouse were busy going over the previous take and had announced a break, so nobody caught the brawl on camera. The production experienced plenty of difficulties, but financing was certainly the most problematic. Filming took place from December 2000 to April 2001, but the money ran out halfway through the process. Scorsese and DiCaprio first lowered their own fees to the minimum allowable level but that barely covered enough to get them through a couple of weeks. They had to ask Weinstein for help. Harvey hadn't liked the idea from the very beginning. It annoyed him that two Hollywood sex symbols were hidden behind mud, makeup, and greasy hair. By the way, Day-Lewis hated his hairstyle so much that he immediately shaved his head the day after the final shot. Yeah. As soon as the budget had been exceeded, Harvey suddenly had more influence on production and demanded that the most violent scenes be cut especially the rat fights and severed ears. Scorsese defended the ears, but the rat fights had to be taken out. The cherry on top was shooting the ending. In the middle of the day, the producer called it a wrap and nearly forced the team to pack up. The desire to save some money led to the team having to come back two months later to finally get the shots they needed. Soldiers now on 38th Street. The mob will not disperse. What are your orders? Weinstein himself, of course, remembers it all differently. All the things I asked Marty not to do, he did. And you know what? I'm totally fine with all of it. Make no mistake, this is Marty's movie. Top to bottom, completely uncompromising. And I didn't ask for a compromise. We went over a few dollars and so what? I made the movie for Marty. I served him. That's what I did as a producer on this film. For Marty, hopefully it will be vindication at the end of a long, hard 27-year road. I know your works. Harvey certainly had his own special way of serving. Even before the film was released, he decided to shield himself from any financial failure and sold the international distribution rights for $65 million. That's a serious advance for such a scrupulous historical drama, especially considering that the director valued authenticity over action. For me, the book, uh, the book, Gangs of New York led to other books, his uh, Herbert Asbury source books, books of the period. I just wanted to say everything. <laughs> Most of the characters and gangs have real life counterparts. The dead rabbits weren't just rabbits. The slang term used by Irish gangs in New York refers to the Gaelic word, rabbit. Translated, it means a person to be feared. What's the battle? Nations against the dead rabbits. What are you? What do you think? 
dead rabbits. Bill the Butcher was the moniker for a man named William Poole. There were also real people called Hellcat Maggie, William Tweed, and P.T. Barnum. Professors from the University of Washington have agreed that the depiction of the Five Points neighborhood matches that of every available historical document. More or less everything, it's, it's very close, close to, the, to what close it was, to, yeah. yes. So, filming had finally finished and that entire summer was spent editing and arguing with Weinstein. The producer nevertheless convinced the director to shorten the runtime by an hour, bringing the film to 167 minutes, which still isn't very short. The premiere was planned for the fall, but September 11th changed the plans of every American that year. Or not, we simply don't know. The film's release, of course, was moved. Martin took part in a charity concert in New York. It had taken Paul McCartney just one month to organize the event, which brought the biggest celebrities in music, movies, and television together on one stage. Leonardo DiCaprio and Robert De Niro presented Scorsese's short film, The Neighborhood. There's probably no one who knows the ins and outs of New York better than my friend, Marty Scorsese. change over acceptance of what America's supposed to be. Letting in the immigrants, letting in other cultures, other religions, other races, and everybody living together in freedom. The release of Gangs of New York was first moved to Christmas, 2001, but then pushed back another year. The official press release said that it was too soon for such a violent movie about the city. Martin took advantage of the delay. He finished shooting everything that he originally didn't have time for and then re-edited the film twice. The biggest change was the complete replacement of the film score. The work of Elmer Bernstein, who had 14 Oscar nominations and 200 films under his belt, was no longer a fit for the new version. But the final shot featuring the Twin Towers was not redone. We did paintings and edited that skyline sequence before September 11th. And afterwards, it was suggested that we should take out the towers. But I felt, it's not my job to revise the New York skyline. The people in the film were part of the creation of that skyline, not the deconstruction of it. And if the skyline collapses, ultimately they will build another one. Finally, the release, distribution, and acceptable result. Gangs of New York fell just short of $200 million in ticket sales. The movie's performance at the Academy Awards ceremony was record-breaking in Scorsese's career. The film received 10 nominations, including Best Director, for which Scorsese hadn't contended in 10 years. John C. Riley also had a notable performance. The actor had starred in four films in the preceding year, and each nominated him for Best Supporting Actor. Although, he wasn't selected. Boy, I'm down at the garage working like Bob 14 hours a day, and she's well, up there munching no, on bonbons and tramping around like some goddamn floozy! Competing against films like the musical Chicago, the drama The Pianist, and The Hours, as well as the fantasy The Lord of the Rings, Gangs of New York was in for a crushing defeat. It didn't bring home a single trophy, the third time that's ever happened in the history of the Oscars. Other films to suffer the same fate were The Turning Point and the color purple. But there was no time to sulk. In the 62nd year of his life, Martin picked up the pace to unprecedented levels. In 2003, he produced and directed an episode of the documentary series, The Blues, where eminent directors explored the development of the greatest American music genre. These rhythms were carefully preserved and passed down generation after generation, through slavery, through Jim Crow, right up till the present. He simultaneously helped the History Channel direct the charity film, Lady by the Sea, The Statue of Liberty. In the aftermath of September 11th attacks, New York's greatest monument had been closed to visitors, and the film raised funds to reopen Liberty Enlightening the World. Hey, do you like our work? Let us know with your like and comment, push that subscribe button, and share with your friends. If you want to support the project financially, become our sponsor on Patreon or YouTube sponsorship. Thank you.